Welcome all to the iHub episode three. Uh, this iHub is, uh, is dedicated to cataract and anterior segment pathology. Uh, thanks to iCare and thanks to Alcon who sponsored this meeting. And uh, actually this episode will be recurrent every Sunday at nine o'clock in different topics. Uh, today I have a distinguished faculty. Uh, I am honored to moderate them. Uh, I have uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Ahmed Shama, Professor Dr. Ahmed Al Masri, Professor Dr. Yahya Salah, and Professor Dr. Fathi Fauzi. Uh, really, I am honored to moderate uh, this session, and I hope that uh, it will be free to, fruitful to all of us. I will start by presenting, uh, the idea is uh, some challenging cases, challenging cases to all of us, and uh, what, uh, how we have solved them, and uh, what is the message that can be delivered to the audience. Uh, actually, I will start... This case, the case was a male, 26 years old, with no other thing. He had a bilateral coronal opacity since birth. He was born in the Sahara of the Sahara, from the Sahara of the Sahara, from the Sahara of the Sahara, from the Sahara of the Sahara. He was born in bilateral coronal opacity since birth. He had a nystagmus. The vision was a navigatory vision. He didn't know how many people could see. لكن كان يجي لما بقول له تعالى اتفضل على الكرسي وقوم وتعالى بيقدر يتوجه وبيقدر يروح من هنا لهنا. Pardon? Do we have foreigners? Do we have non Arabic speaking? Uh, okay. If we have foreigners, we will speak in English. This is a case of bilateral corneal facies since birth and there was some nystagmus. And uh, I have done for him a right penetrating keratoplasty on, on uh, 2016. And uh, I have removed the sutures in 2017. And then uh, there was an endocelial rejection since uh, March 2018, and 18, treated with intensive steroids, but in vain there was a rejection and there was a cataract. And the vision was at that stage hand movement good projection. What to do? I decided to redo the PKP and to remove the cataract, what we call triple procedure, another PKP, cataract, and IOL. This is his biometry, and we can see that the axial length is 26.91, which is long a little bit, of course. AC depth is 2.91, which is okay. And the length thickness is 2.61, and the K1 and K2 and IOL power to be plus nine and a half directors. And this is a myopic person, and I had to deal with such a case. What is my plan? I started by measuring the, the graft and preparing the graft, and then I will redo the PKP at the same line of the previous PKP. I opened the anterior chamber. I have put some viscoelastic inside, and then, in such case, I prefer just to, yani, to separate both surfaces from each other like you are, you are seeing. Actually, like the LASIK, you can actually separate the PKP even years after performing it. As you are, you are seeing now, this is without refining, without anything. Just, I, I will use the scissors in the last portion of uh, in order to separate the most posterior part, adding some viscoelastic and then continuing my PKP, of course, under general anesthesia. This is a total white cataract. I told myself why not to, get to, to do a proper capsulorexis, and I started my rexis. And this is what happened. And then and at this stage, actually, I was, uh, I was not okay because I, I thought that this may be an expulsive. And at this stage, 
I thought, what, what is wrong in such condition? What I have done wrong in such condition? To continue, by the irrigation aspiration, I cleaned the cortex thoroughly. Up till now, it's a faint red reflex, but actually it is seen. The pupil is widely dilated. And this is the Argentina flex sign. This Argentina flex sign, it, it, the, the, there was, and I tried to put the, uh, the lens. Actually, I thought that I am in the sulcus, but it was somewhat difficult to introduce. After some time, I introduced it thinking that I am in the sulcus. And just before putting the, the graft, I realized that it was not at that stage, it was over the iris. And once more, I took it and trying to put it in the sulcus. This time it's okay. And I started my sutures. Actually, what I want to discuss in such condition that with very possible expulsive hemorrhage, with very possible uh, a high risk for my patient, what it should be the, the proper act from before, what is the proper plan in such condition? <clears throat> Actually, I, I tried to search uh, uh, what to do before. I thought that uh, maybe if laringa ring that we, we ought to put at a certain time during our uh, residency, uh, because he is high myope and there is low clear rigidity, maybe one uh, item. Another item, maybe uh, anyone of the of you have uh, used the artificial cornea you know in vitrectum if there is a corneal opacity the posterior segment surgeons are sometimes putting artificial cornea temporary artificial cornea till they are doing the vitrectum and then at the end they are removing it and uh, putting the proper graft uh, Anyone has experience in such maneuver? Yes. Uh, if, if I may, Dr. Ale? Yes, please. Uh, what I tried in, in opaque corneas in general, I would have tried in this case too, is trying to debulk the, the cornea, to debulk the, the graft until I'm yes. left with just dual membrane. I know you, everything is going to be removed, but when you come to reach the dual layer, mm. you, uh, the the layers left are too thin to obstruct the view. So when you have a thin cornea, even if it's opaque, it allows you to have some visualization. When you put in methyl uh, cellulose, you cannot irrigate the stroma, it will turn opaque. You just pour methyl cellulose all the time, and then you should be able to do uh, a emulsification through, I would suggest scleral incisions or posterior limbal incisions. Uh, 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 I would but, definitely, but definitely, I would definitely put a flaring ring as long mm -hmm. as I'm going to open the glue. Okay. I would do uh, this technique when I'm doing uh, lamellar keratoplasty. In this case, he had already endothelial keratoplasty. When mm -hmm. I do lamellar keratoplasty in such cases, mm -hmm. I would leave do as labor and do fake on this location. But in this case, he already had the problem of Already, it is a whole thickness yes. of the application and it was endothelial rejection. So yes. it might not be that uh, easy to do, mm -hmm. the, uh, to have a good visualization, even if it's thin. I mean, but I don't have a, uh, to answer your question, I don't have uh, experience with keratoprothesis temporary in such cases. Right? Yes, because, uh, yes, it, it, is, it is an option temporary keratoprothesis and then doing uh, the trectomy, they are doing the posterior segment surgeon. Yes, they do. Yes. Uh, maybe, maybe it's an option because, of course, open sky uh, cataract surgery is a help and really it's uh, very challenging. Dr. Ala. I presented a, a quadruple uh, procedure in which I removed an anterior chamber uh, IOL and I used the flaringa ring. It was very nice. I could do a capsular access in such a condition. And I used the flaringa ring to uh, put uh, iris hooks also. It was very helpful. That's okay, but, but you have noticed that there was uh, an Argentina flag uh, sign. There was a, a complete uh, tear 
from up down for for these rexes and uh, yeah, i think uh, if you put the flaringa ring i think because the flaringa ring will pull out the sclera and the um, and the area of the limbus i think that the lens wouldn't be under this pressure i think so i'm not sure but i'm thinking mechanically because this flaringa ring will, will will keep the sclera away from the iris lens the frag maybe is, hmm. yes and the, the second point is that yes i tried i did once the artificial keratoprothesis with the, one of the procedure segment surgeons that i removed the hmm. cornea i put the artificial cornea and then took the sutures and he did his vitrectomy and put his silicone and then i put the graft at the end it's a very tedious procedure but oh. it helps a lot at the time yes dr yahya i'm sorry for interruption no, no I'm, I'm just saying this was a really intumescent cataract so yes. it, uh, the pressure was was high it is only that you were uh, yeah, uh, taking it at ease so that's why it did not really uh, give all the concentration we give when doing uh, absolute access in intumescent cataract particularly that here you don't have an anterior oh, chamber yes. to tamponade the capsule yeah. so it's very possible easy that it will extend like this so sometimes yeah. you can make just a horizontal sketch and uh, let the fluid come out even if it extends it's going to be circular and you can spray it or cut it with scissors even hmm. okay something wrong happened i tried to to show it again <coughs> we can move to the second case. Yes, of course, but uh, he's not responding. <laughs> yes. بحب اقول كومنت العظم الدكتور علاء يعني يجهز ان ايفن اف ام بلاننج تو دو تريبل ام جوينج تو ريموف ذا هول كونيا اف دان كوايت يعني ا بانش اوف كيسز وان اي ديفالك ذا كونيا اند انا ام بلاننج تو ريموف ذا هول ثينج بس اف اي ليف جاست ا ثين لاير اند اند بور فيسكولاستيك اون ذا توب يو شود بي ابل تو هاف سام جود فيجواليزيشن ان وين يو فينيش ذا يور فيكو مالسيفيكيشن And uh, include the pupil with the myotic, and, uh, and inject viscoelastic, and then remove the the, the rest of the pore. Yes, and thank you very much for these comments. Actually, it's a message that must be delivered to the audience. Next case is a short case, female, 65 years old, hypertensive since 22 years, having stroke, but she was in good condition. Ischemic heart disease with stents on aspirin, bilateral dense nuclear cataract. But actually, the case. Seems straightforward. Axial lens somewhat uh, long, a little bit myopic. Uh, AC depths of very good, nice 3.22 millimeters, K1, K2, and I plan to put a Technis IOL plus 16 and half diopters. Uh, the surgery went uh, okay for everything. In my usual technique, uh, I am opening in this uh, and then putting the viscoelastic and then uh, doing my rexes and uh, everything looked a uh, straightforward case to start with. The usual rexes, nothing wrong. The, the, as you are seeing, the red reflex is okay and the rexes is going okay and nothing wrong in, in, in this case. Everything was going okay. I have done the side ports as usual and then the cortical cleavage hydro dissection yes decompression and then rotating and my usual technique which is divide and conquer that i like it very much and everything passed well in such condition nothing was wrong This is my division, uh, my uh, divide and conquer technique. I am doing the 
the initial division and then doing perpendicular to it 90 degrees, dividing the lens into two pieces and seeing the red reflex. And before completing, I am trying to do the other quadrant in order that the lens will be stuck to each other and then getting the old quadrant and the cortex. During the cortex, I have noticed that there was no anterior chamber actually. The anterior chamber was almost lost. I tried, I, I felt the eye, it, the tension, I thought that there was something wrong, expulsive or something. There is no anterior chamber, meaning that I am putting the irrigation inside, but actually nothing. And I was thinking, what's wrong? Trying to get rid of this cortex. There is a complete sheet, very thin sheet of the cortex. Actually, nothing, no anterior chamber. Finally, I, I have tried, although it was somewhat difficult to get rid of all the cortex. And then I was prepared to put the IOL, any viscoelastic, there was um, no space. Actually, there is no space to put the IOL. The iris is stuck to the cornea. There is no space to put the IOL. What I did actually is many tool by rapid intravenous injection and general anesthesia with hyperventilation. I removed the speculum. I thought about pars plana vitrectomy actually, because uh, the idea, what happened? I was thinking what happened? I was thinking about equus misdirection, that the equus was misdirected behind from the high flow uh, rate used during surgery. And after about 25 minutes, I resumed my surgery under general anesthesia after removing the speculum and trying to get a space inside this anterior chamber. And uh, with extreme difficulty, look for the iris, it's coming out. The idea don't put, and again, general anesthesia at that time, after so many trials, I succeeded. I tried a little bit widening the incision in order that the lens will be put at ease a little bit. And then the lens was put in place and everything passed all right. What I'm asking for, uh, for you, what is your experience with such case? Is it so frequent? Actually, it is not so frequent, but every now and then you will find, I have taken one suture and every now and then you, you can find such case. Uh, any one of you having the same experience? Actually, next case, it was visual active point eight uncorrected and there was nothing uh, uh, wrong with, with, with the case. But uh, I'm asking what's your experience with this and is it equus misdirection really? Or what, what is the explanation of uh, no anterior chamber whatsoever? <laughs> if, if I may, uh, say, I have uh, some, uh, in a few cases, of course, it's not something common, but it could be also impending expulsive hemorrhage. And uh, I think the right thing, what you did, you know, I had this problem in one case after the capsular access. Mm -hmm. So actually I stopped, I, in one case I stopped and got the patient out uh, in the recovery, I gave him, a money tool and waited maybe for one hour and then I readmitted the patient <clears throat> when I saw that the anterior chamber is formed so I continued the surgery. Another case I postponed for the uh, week after and we did ultrasonography and there was suprachoroidal hemorrhage in both and I did it after one week though the, the anterior capsular axis was done. It was, it, it was okay, you give medical treatment, uh, some uh, cortex is getting in the anterior chamber, but this was much better, the outcome, than trying to finish uh, the surgery on the spot. The and I, think, I think what you did is exactly, yeah, I mean, is excellent and very wise. Yeah, thank you. I, 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 it's a message that if you find such a case, think about equus uh, misdirection, and just give money to her, remove the speculum, change to general anesthesia with hyperventilation, wait a little bit, and maybe, the, I mean, like my case, I was lucky enough, 
uh, to put the lens in place. And next day, she was almost completely normal with such suture. I think, Dr. Ala, it's nearly like the same you showed before of um, uh, closed angle glaucoma with high pressure before the surgery. So it's the same plan, whether if it didn't uh, um, pass smoothly, you can uh, start uh, vitrectomy to do Part just a kind of vitrectomy, cor cor colorization of the vitreous, but not vitreous tap. Vitreous tap is uh, absolutely contraindicated because this is definitely will induce vitreous traction. So if you're going to decide to remove the vitreous, 23 gauge needle sutureless uh, and do um, uh, pulse plan of Yes, yes. This uh, is if I may add that we need to have a look yes. with the indirect ophthalmoscope first before we do yes, the anterior yes. vitrectomy. Mm -hmm. And yes. the other yes. advice is don't do too much anterior vitrectomy. Otherwise, yes. you have yes. actually yes. a problem with the too hypotonic eye and the very yes. floppy egg. It's really five to ten cuts maximum it yes. should be yes. enough to re revert the case. That's right. That's right. Uh, That's right. I agree. Don't you think, Dr. Ala, it may be a problem of anesthesia? Maybe the patient, the patient was... No, she uh, was the, not, Ahmed. She was not... not, uh, not yeah, usually it's topical and uh, with sedation. But actually, this patient is educated and uh, and she yeah. was okay. I and mean, she, she was not agitated. She was not... Uh, she wasn't no, obese. Not she wasn't short neck. Uh, nothing to... Uh, Nothing. Mm -hmm. well, my explanation is uh, equus misdirection. It's Maybe the high flow rate uh, has helped uh, in that condition. Thank you. Okay, I think. I think, uh, uh, I, I, I think this occurs in high myopic uh, eyes uh, more than uh, regular eyes because there is escape of some aqueous from the uh, zonule. Uh, yeah. And uh, I think uh, that I face this once or twice a year with myself and uh, one of my colleagues. And uh, uh, the first thing is not to try to form the anterior chamber with the viscoelastic material. Yeah. If you are trying to do this, you will get more and more of a problem. The so iris is coming. The iris will come out. You need to decompress the eye slightly with an iris repository. Let some aqueous come out of the eye. And then try this again and again until you feel that the, the two chamber is deeper by itself and the eye is softer. Then you can continue. Not before that you feel that the eye is, is not tense. But not, don't try to put aqueous or don't try to put viscoelastic. Thank you very much. And now we can go to the Professor Yahya Salah. Uh, who will uh, present, uh, I believe, rock heart, heart cataract, Yahya? Yes. yes. Yalla, go on, Yahya. Is it shared now? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> my topic is a little bit different. I'm not going to talk about a complication. I'm rather going to talk about how to avoid complications and in heart cataracts, it's always it's a challenge. Each case is a challenge. So my idea here is to have a concept that you can reproduce your technique in the safest way. And the concept should be, it is not only about removing the cataract, and the success is not only to remove the cataract, but it's about removing the cataract safely. And this is extremely important because in such cases, we have two main fears. One, excessive ultrasound near the corneal endothelium causing corneal decompensation or the fear of pursuing capsule rupture with a hard nucleus and then it, things complicate more. So these are the, the fears that you have to put in mind and we have to have a strategy how to deal with such cases. The heart cataract has a, a, its a special characters and but we want to change the heart cataract, the difficult case into the regular case that we are usually doing at ease and more comfortably in a safer manner. And so again, the challenges in such cases are number one is capsular access. We can overcome this by, by having, by doing capsular stain. We have a thick nucleus and a hard nucleus. The nucleus is thick and hard and we can overcome this by what I call two nuclei concept. So 
so the idea is to save the cornea using least energy. So you want to remove this big nucleus in a safe manner using the least energy needed. You don't depend on energy so as not to insult the corneal endothelium. And the, the just So this is the idea of the two nuclei concept. I call it two nuclei because I think of the nucleus, it is thick. What I can, when you break down the problem, you say, this is a thick nucleus. So I wanted to, to change it into a regular sized nucleus so I can do the maneuvers I'm used to. And it is hard, so I want to weaken it, use less energy, and more vector. So this is why the term two nuclei comes. The first thing is to debulk the upper part of the nucleus as if shaving the, shaving the upper, the, the, the first nucleus. And in this way, you are creating a crater, having the bevel down. So the propagation of energy is least to, toward the corneal in the sea. And at this stage, you can use a little bit more power, like 60% or 70%. Second, you create a wide crater. The groove should be wide. You don't have to be long. And the width of the, of the, of the groove or the crater allows you to see well in the depth. So you are not afraid. One of the mistakes that you are, you are making the same trench you are used to. So you are very limited view to the floor. You are afraid to perforate. Then you leave a thick shell of the nucleus and make it, and this will make it difficult to crack later on and this is the, why the, the term leathery nucleus comes and we will see this in a moment S third thing i do i add to the two nuclei concept what i call hole drilling so the idea now i created a wide crater so i can see very well the depth i can remove as much cortex uh, 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 nuclear fibers and the cortical fibers as much as I need to reach the floor. Second, I have a very thick nucleus, so I want to weaken this nucleus with a well-exposed tip, which is very important thing in heart cataract to expose well the tip out of the uh, silicon uh, sleeve. So I drill holes, and these holes will go around 360 degrees this will weaken the wall, as if you, are, you want to put down a wall, actual wall. If you do drill, you weaken the strength of the wall. When you push it, it will fall down. This is the idea of the whole drilling, using the very, very well exposed tip. So the rules and tips to some here is good exposure of the proteco tip. No hydrosection. I never do hydrosection if I don't see the wave of the fluid passing behind the nucleus. This is the first reason why I don't do and don't advise hydrosection in hard nuclei. Second reason not doing hydrosection, at the beginning, doing these maneuvers, you need a fixed nucleus. You don't want the nucleus to rotate. So that's why I don't do hydrosection. Third, you have a higher risk of doing capsule rupture or uh, capsular block syndrome if you don't see the wave, the wave with the hard nucleus and the uh, uh, fluid collects behind the nucleus in front of the posterior capsule and it can rupture. And as a general rule, if you have a hard nucleus, you don't have to use too much power. You use the power needed to do the job as we are going to see. So I'm going to stress I'm going to stress the technique. This is, I will skip the, the point of capsular axis. You need usually to have a little bit larger capsular axis, but you start with debulking. You can see creating the, the white deep crater. The tip is very well exposed because you don't want a stopper or, or anything to stop you from going 
through the nucleus. Now this is in a slow motion, just to show you how the lens is rotating only by the fluid without hydrosection, and how you can go and impale the nucleus do doing this whole drilling technique as well. Ferris shaving, you can see exactly what you are doing because you have a wide well. The whole essence of this technique is that you see what you do. You convert the difficult into a regular uh, case in a systematic way. Now you can see the nucleus rotating and then after doing the whole drilling all around, you crack. You see, you have in this way, you can see exactly what is preventing you from splitting the nucleus. And your main work is in the capsular bag to be as further, further away from the cornea as possible. You can see these fibers, you can split it. Because you see, you know why it comes back. It is not gummy, it's only you are leaving fibers. So what you do is you make sure that you split the fibers all through. You see how valuable is the, the, the long exposure of the tip? because you can embed inside and you can make the best value of the vacuum. So you're holding the zap as a fork and the knife. The fork is the tip and the knife is the chopper. This is Noy and chopper. I do vertical splitting and this is very useful in hard cataract and small cupids because you can see what you are doing. You are splitting the fibers to the last fiber, preventing the crack. You see? And I'm not present, do, doing any pressure on the zenules because actually I'm pushing towards the zenules, not away from the zenules. At this point, the power is 30%. Vacuum is 450 millimeters of mercury. And you help with the chopper to cut the nucleus into smaller and smaller pieces. If you don't have good exposure of the tip, you will always have a problem embedding into the nucleus. And the key in dealing with such cases is to embed properly in the nucleus. So as you can hold it, maneuver with it, cut it into smaller and smaller pieces and split it in the way that is safe to the cornea end to the posterior capsule. Also sometimes in very hard cataracts, from the, usually I work with the 2.2 millimeter incision, so I need a smaller tip. In such cases, I, I ask for a bigger tip that fits into through 2.8 millimeter incision. And the bigger tip allows for better occlusion and less time to remove the nucleus. You can see how is the flow of the nucleus, nucleus fragments, because you feed it into the tip and slice it into smaller and smaller pieces, even if it's hard, and always keep one of the whole marks in such cases for during the work, work, you can of course stop and put viscoelastic again, but you can see the cornea. I want you to see the cornea all through and the incision. You avoid doing burn by interrupting your work, your ultrasound, and at the same time, if you are insulting the cornea, you can see Usually by the end of the, the surgery, you will see striate keratopathy. But, but as you can see, I can predict the post-operative for the patient by seeing what's happening. Sometimes you have very fine vacuoles of air entrapped at the back of the cornea and the, uh, being in, entrapped at the back of the cornea. And the, if you see it, it doesn't move. If you, if you see it, it doesn't move. This is a good sign that you're not insulting uh, the cornea. Let's move to uh, another case. This is a very particular case because I have the, the, uh, multiple difficulties. The patient was more than, uh, than 85 years old. He has kyphosis. We had to position the, the bed as you can see. And this is the maximum that the patient can tolerate in this position. So he had a black cataract, as you're going to see, but I had to work standing. So working standing, you will have only one foot to use. 
And usually we are using the food, one food for the microscope, the other one for the trichot. Here you have to work standing using the, the one food for the trichot emulsification uh, food switch. And the focus is difficult. And sometimes you can ask the assistant to, to do the focus for you. As you can see, there is one nurse hiding here. So this is the first challenge. The second challenge is this is a true, yeah, this is a true black cataract. It's a true black cataract. So you have to have all the rules I've just talked about to be able to perform the same difficult case with the same safety margins, same tips to, to deal with such a case. Doing capsular staining, I, I work topical anesthesia almost 99.9% .9 of the cases. So aiming at a little bit larger rexes, in such cases you anticipate weeks and yields. You see how big is the exposure? Doing exactly the same technique I described. Shaving the upper part of the nucleus, creating a crater. And when I remove the first part, I can redirect uh, the lens. Here, I discovered I did not complete the rexes. So I stopped and, and completed the rexes and then continued my technique. The value of working with high magnification, you can exactly see what you're doing. You can anticipate problems, you can prevent complications, and you can understand in the learning curve how everything is behaving inside the eye. The white crater, you can see I'm working with one foot. Same technique, white crater, bevel down, then turn it, shave until you reach the floor. Hole drilling, tweaking the nucleus, then dealing with the nucleus piece by piece by vertical chopping. Even if the pupil gets down, with vertical chopping, you have no problem because you see what you're doing. Here, I got this nuclear part get, went into the anterior chamber. You push it back with this elastic and make advantage of coating the corneal endothelium with metal solutes, for example, this to adapt. To, to protect the corneal endothelium. Again, your aim is to work in the posterior chamber as much as you can. Don't ever do supranuclear, supracapsular, take one emancipation or go into the anterior chamber intention. You see how far is the tip? Even if the nucleus part gets here, you'll get it back, but you are working posteriorly. With little, I hear the ultrasound at this stage is 30% and you chop into smaller and smaller pieces. This type of lenses needs a lot of patience because it takes longer than usually it would take. Mm. But so long you have in mind protect, the protection of the cornea, protection of the posterior capsule, this is very important. And these uh, nuclei usually never ends. When, when you think you are done, you still have a big chunk to continue. You can see the cornea, you can see the wound, then everything is, you, you, are, you have done your job removing this nucleus safely by following the rules, even if the pupil went down, even if you are working standing. Then you, you wash the posterior capsule, inject the lens in the capsular bag, and you can see the wound. There is no burn in the wound, which means you were doing the job. The, the shading in the iris, because the pupil got down, during work. So just to, to capitulate, you can, if you have a small pupil even, if you, have, if you know the rules, then you can reapply it in every case. So you can convert a difficult case by itself by having a hard nucleus, thick nucleus that you fear to damage, you damage the cornea or damage the posterior capsule, you can safely go in a step manner in a very clear concept and strategy 
to remove the nucleus safely, protecting the corneal endothelium and protecting the posterior capsule, even when conditions and circumstances are more difficult, like the, the black cataract with difficult positioning or, or working in a small pupil like this. So, in conclusion, for heart cataracts, follow the rules to be safe. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yahya, for this uh, very nice illustration for the management of hard rock cataract. Actually, uh, for anyone who wants to ask a question or do a comment for, from the audience, just uh, in the YouTube or on the Facebook, uh, write a comment. This comment will reach us and we'll answer your questions. Uh, yeah, yeah, good job, very good job, actually. And uh, if there is comments, we are ready for the comments. I have a question, Tarek. Tarek, you said that you don't do hydrodissection in such cases. How do you know for sure when you are working that uh, with your uh, flow of fluid during your FACO that there is complete separation of the uh, nucleus from the capsule and you, you can start at that time rotating the nucleus safely without endangering the zoonules? Uh, it's a good question, but it's uh, it's uh, two reasons I said. One, I don't want to do hydrosection because I want the nucleus not to rotate at the beginning during the first part of the surgery. About rotating, how do, do I know rotating or not? It will rotate because I will see it rotating if uh, when I'm working. When I hold, because remember, when I was doing the whole drilling, it was rotating. If it doesn't rotate, I, I will try to rotate it mechanically without uh, putting pressure on the zinules. But almost always, it will rotate because it will be hydrodissected only by the flow of the fake. Can we do hydrodissection at that time when you want to rotate the nucleus? You can start again your hydrodissection. It's possible, but I never found it necessary because it's always at that point, it is rotated. And you can do the hydro section, but very carefully because you will not see the wave. The, the, the problem here, if you don't see the wave and the, you're not very experienced how much you inject, you can do cause posterior capsule rupture by capsular block. Actually, I believe in such a very hard rock cataract, uh, yani, it will rotate by itself. Yani, even without any hydro dissection, if you try to rotate it, it will rotate with you by itself. Actually, for myself, I am doing a little bit of hydro uh, dissection. Always, I like to start my FACO after uh, rotating my, uh, my nucleus. I am very uncomfortable by uh, starting my FACO if the nucleus is not rotating for me. Uh, but excellent uh, idea, and actually, it's quite near to what I am doing. I am doing uh, divide and conquer, and I am doing a wide trench and going down and down and down. You know that what we call tenacious fibers, you can uh, overcome this by going more down a little bit and then doing your dissection, uh, your uh, splitting. Uh, actually, excellent technique, Dr. Yahya. Any comment uh, from Dr. Fathi or Dr. Masri? Uh, it's, it's not a question, just a comment. There are two things. And uh, Yahya was saying that uh, when you are uh, uh, chopping the, this hard nucleus, you don't challenge the zinules. I agree, but actually you challenge the capsular excess. So you have to 100% trust your rexes. If the rexes, you have a, a, a tent or a, a part you don't trust, really this can extend very easily. So uh, a perfect rexis in this case is mandatory. Mm -hmm. And, and wide, second, a little bit wide rexis, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the second the second tip is removing the last hard quadrant. Because actually you have now a sharp knife very close to the posterior capsule. Posterior capsule comes towards you. I'd li I like to inject some uh, heavy viscoelastic to push the, the capsule back while I'm removing the, the last uh, quadrant and put down the, uh, the uh, parameters a little bit. I, I usually go into the uh, epinucleus program, although I still have quadrants, 
but usually it's, you have enough power to remove the last quadrant, but in a gentle way, because the circle too keeps it playing at this moment. It's okay, and uh, I believe we are now in time for Professor Masri to present uh, his case. Dr. Masri. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, maybe this is a little bit different than the previous talks about the FACO itself and the cataract, but we, we really face this problem uh, many times and just want to know uh, the causes and techniques of uh, IOL exchange. Of course, the most common is the wrong power. Um, this is an old case of extra capsular cataract extraction with the PMMA IOL, and it had the wrong power with, um, after two months, she was referred to me for IOL exchange. It's so simple and easy, but again, the tricks that you have to have a perfect biometry. And um, the second thing is to uh, have a viscoelastic, Dr. Yahya, you have to put a lot of viscoelastic in these cases. Uh, and the best, is, of course, is the visco cohesive to protect the corner because many cases are a little bit um, difficult to be removed, not like this case, uh, because it was recent. So the um, delivery from the bag is easy and the incision wasn't so big. So uh, just uh, changing the uh, PMMA with another one and taking your sutures, maybe two or three sutures are enough with the correct power. This is the most common cause of exchange of intraocular lens till now known. But there are other um, causes of IOL exchange with different periods or with different um, time after the surgery. Here you can visco, even put the IOL in one, IOL. one point visco adhesive, not visco cohesive, to protect the uh, cornea. Visco adhesive, yes. Yes. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, this is sorry. And this is second case of opacified IOL. Mm -hmm. We see opacified IOLs. M many surgeons ignore or think that is opacity in the posterior capsule and uh, not um, an opacified IOL. This patient was referred to me for doing YAG laser. It was the aunt of one of our colleagues that he did her cataract um, since about uh, two years. And you see how the IOL is adherent to the capsule and you have to be very gentle in these cases because these adhesions should be relieved to free the IOL from the bag. Uh, again, you have to be prepared with all your tools you may have the whole IOL with the bag. You may have rent in the posterior capsule. So you should be prepared with the three pieces IOL or with even the um, artisan or the very size. I don't have any financial interest that you may find the whole bag is out or even with the Yemeni technique to do IOL, uh, second IOL implantation. Um, then, uh, once the IOL, one of these haptics are out, it's easy to get the rest of the bag out and uh, you can put it in the anterior chamber and then to get it out. The techniques of getting the IOL out, as you see here, it is a opacified IOL. The, the, there are a lot of um, surgeons that are trying different types of IOL with low biomechanics. And as you see here, it is opaque one. There are different techniques. The, this technique, yes, you are holding the IOL from one, from one side. You are opening a little bit the side port and you cut the IOLs into two halves. Um, with the with the regular uh, corneal scissors, yes, you can have just part is uh, um, cut, and then you can rotate it through the wound, and you can get it uh, all in one piece. But um, I feel that this endangers the cornea more. You have to be sure that the IOL is complete. As you see here, the IOL is totally opaque, and then you have still the bag, and you can still put your intraocular lens. I prefer here to put three to put uh, three pieces IOL, uh, whether in the bag or in the sulcus. Um, to be sure of the centralization and the uh, uh, quality, of course, of the IOL uh, should be respected in these cases. And uh, if the bag is open, you can put it in the bag. If it's uh, in the sulcus, you can put it in the sulcus also with no fear of disintegration. And again, the, the procedure had been finished. Again, taking care of the cornea, putting a lot of uh, viscoelastics to protect the cornea because most of these patients 
have opaque, uh, have um, corneal opacity after the surgery. Air bubble at the end to be sure that your wound doesn't need any suture. And postoperatively, there wasn't so much corneal edema as you see here, and the patient passed safely. Um, this is the uh, another case of opacified IOL. As you see here, the, it's very clear here that the IOL is opacified. There is no other choice that you have to remove this uh, lens. Uh, don't expect that all the cases will be easy to be uh, delivered or to be um, uh, taken out of the bag because uh, as long as the time passes, you may find more adhesions and more uh, lens uh, fibers or lens cells in the bag. So again, delivering the anterior, the, the IOL in the anterior chamber, putting the viscoelastic, cutting it into two halves, holding it from one side, widening the side port. And um, the point is, is to have the counter action or the counter force of uh, holding the IOL and then cutting it into uh, uh, pieces. The more foldable the IOL, the more difficult will be uh, cutting the IOL as you're gonna see in the trifocals and the multifocals later on. Um, once you have two parts, again, giving viscoelastic all of the time will protect the cornea, having the two halves out, and then to reassess the anterior, uh, the anterior segment, whether uh, you can put an IOL or not, or whether this synechia could be released. Of course, releasing the synechia, having the bag and having the sulcus here to decide polishing the posterior capsule, and then again, putting your three pieces IOL, which is the safest in these situations. But you have to be again prepared with the other uh, uh, IOLs. Yes, with the other options, yes. Uh, putting the IOL on the sulcus and then irrigating aspiration and irrigation of the lens matter. And uh, again, the wound is um, safe and closed and you don't need to have a suture. Um, again, uh, here, um, a case of decentered IOL, this is another um, uh, indication of IOL exchange. The patient came, if I kick, and uh, he did surgery somewhere else. And here, the plan from the start to do uh, um, very size or uh, artisan ICL, uh, I, IOL, uh, putting the, uh, getting the haptics of the uh, IOL out, be very careful because here definitely there's a rent in the posterior capsule. Uh, so delivering the, um, the, the, the lens in the anterior chamber, the patient received some subconjunctival anesthesia because he was a little bit in um, agony. And then because you're gonna open the wound and um, it's very important to know when to put the anesthesia or uh, at which time, because here once you open the globe, it will be a little bit difficult holding from one side and getting the lens out again with uh, uh, be sure that there is no vitreous in the anterior chamber and um, the pupil had been constricted. It's very regular. There was no vitreous and inserting your uh, very size or artisan uh, IOL in the anterior chamber holding with the special forceps and even without these forces with the regular McPherson, you can do the um, holding and uh, you can do the enclavation, whether with the enclavator or from the side uh, port at uh, 108 and zero degrees. So it's very important to mark the zero and 180 degrees or the horizontal um, marks to be sure that the lens in the central position not shifted up or down and then taking your sutures one or two, it depends on the uh, size of the wound that you have uh, removed the, the lens from. So at the end, you have the iridotomy. Don't forget to do the iridotomy to prevent the capsule block um, um, uh, and the increase of the intraocular pressure. Uh, another uh, indication is the exchange of the multifocal IOL with another multifocal IOL. This patient is one of my patients that had been wrongly put the um, IOL of the right eye in her left eye with a different power. So I decided to exchange the trifocal and to put another uh, trifocal IOL instead. Um, this maybe was the first time to exchange a trifocal uh, physiol. Uh, uh, and honestly, I found difficulty in cutting this lens. It is uh, very malleable, smooth, and um, this uh, Mickey Mouse or the um, uh, open haptics um, uh, design uh, in cutting or in removal of the lens needs a little bit more manipulation. As you see, we are trying to do a counter pressure, 
try to hold the lens itself by freeing the um, inferior part in order not to hold the capsule and then counting counter pressure with the spatula because if you don't have this counter pressure you will find the IOL will uh, hit the angle that may induce bleeding as you see here it's very malleable and it's difficult to be hold then I decided to change the technique to hold it with the McPherson from the side port the patient again was under sedation and wasn't she wasn't so cooperative again giving more viscoelastic widening the side port holding the lens putting again visco behind the lens to protect it and uh, then holding with the McPherson to find uh, a counter pressure. Um, in this situation, again, I thought in getting the lens in just by cutting this part, not to cut the whole lens out, uh, but I found it's difficult to get it out. And then the big problem is to find small pieces of the IOL floating in the tear chamber. So you have to be very careful because if you, miss, if you may miss one of these cases, uh, pieces, it will be a problem. As you see here, I, I opened or I, I um, uh, um, increased the size of the wound a little bit, but taking care because this is a trifocal patient, so he's aiming for zero astigmatism or 0.25 max. Uh, so widening the wound will induce more astigmatism, but th this was the trial to allow the uh, IOL to be out. I divided half of it and then rotate it and uh, get the other half. Uh, again, putting again visco more and more to uh, protect the cornea and the endothelium because definitely these cases will have endothelial cell loss definitely more than usual because you are manipulating too much. So again, specular before the surgery is important to know from the, your starting point. And then we got the lens in again, the two halves. And um, as you see here, once it's out, the the... The, the situation became more easy and more smooth, so you can put the other uh, trifocal in place. Yes, you have uh, enlarged the wound a little bit. Again, the soft shell technique and putting under the other trifocal. Yes, this patient took a little bit, some more time for the rehabilitation due to the corneal edema, but at the end, by one month, the patient was so satisfied even because there was no astigmatism induced more because still the wound is less than 2.6 millimeter. And uh, you did what you should do is by changing the uh, trifocal, which is um, was a wrong uh, uh, biometry. Yes, you can wait and do LASIK for this patient, but it's another um, procedure or another technique and another uh, way to correct the biometry error if it is low. And in this case, it was about one and a half diopter or two diopters because the difference between uh, one eye, it was this eye was 11 and a half and the other one is 13 and a half. And, she, and we put the 13 and a half instead of the 11 and a half. So simply changing the IOL early will be the better solution for this patient. Um, and again, uh, this is uh, the last video. And uh, as you see here, this is a little bit uh, not very common situation. I think it, it was my first case to do it. It was about 65 year age uh, patient, male patient. Um, and um, his, his job uh, um, needs to speak to the people for a period of half an hour or one hour. And he should uh, read and see the distance without uh, wearing glasses. And he came to me asking for cataract surgery. I told him, okay, we can do the trifocal or the regular monofocal with the uh, uh, differences of um, advantages and disadvantage of the quality of vision. And then I put him the Technus one uh, monofocal and he was uh, 20, 20 after the surgery. And then he uh, went for six months and come back and he told me, I want to put a trifocal instead of the monofocal. I asked him why. We didn't uh, choose the trifocal from the start. He told me I was convinced, but my friends told me it's preferable to put the monofocal. You don't know, you don't know what is the result of this uh, new trifocals. But he came back, said my job necessita necessitates that I don't wear glasses all of the time. So here may be the first time to exchange a monofocal IOL with a trifocal IOL. For this patient, I did uh, eye trace it to know the higher the vibrations before and after clarifying for the patient that the quality of vision will be definitely less after the surgery, even for um, months. And I followed him, uh, followed him up up to three months. And yes, the high order abrasions had been increased a lot, but uh, at the end, the patient was satisfied. There was some comp compromise 
of the sharp distant vision, but he took off the glasses and he didn't um, wear glasses after uh, whether for the distance and for the knee. So patient counseling is very important to know whether the patient, um, uh, his uh, way or his job or his um, way of living needs the trifocal or not. Getting out the monofocal, putting viscoelastic, washing the um, remnants of the lens matter. It was after six months of the surgery and after cleaning the bag. And this is another difficult point here. We cannot put the trifocal in the sulcus. You have to put it in the bag. So you have to be sure that the bag is totally opened from uh, all the sides. And as you see here, there will be, there will be some difficulty for putting this malleable uh, haptics, malleable open haptics in the bag. But you have to take your time to be sure that to put the uh, the whole lens inside the bag. Otherwise, the disintegration here may induce more and more abrasion and more dissatisfaction. Yes, the decision of uh, changing a monofocal with a trifocal, there are a lot of difficulties. There are a lot of astigmatism that could be induced. And um, after this eye, I did him the other eye after one week. So these are the causes of uh, exchange of IOL. And I hope that I sent a message how to get the IOL out and what are the different techniques. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Uh, actually, we have some questions from the audience. And yes. for Al Masri, there is two questions. One of them from Islam Shirim, our colleagues. Uh, he thanks you for the nice presentation. And uh, he wants to know uh, if you are doing iridotomy when you are uh, putting this uh, artisan or... Uh, 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 yes, in, if I'm putting it in the anterior chamber, definitely I'm doing iridotomy. But uh, many papers have been published. If you put it retropupillary, you don't mm. need to put iridotomy. But I don't like putting the artisan or the very size retropupillary because mm. all of us face that uh, this one of this, the enclavations had, is um, is uh, displaced or the one of the of the lens is displaced. So you have to re-enter again to do enclavation. If this displacement happens for a retropupillary artisan definitely it's not my job i have to refer him to pursue a segment session because it will fall down in the vitreous and refer it to you islam to take the job another tip that uh, dr muhammad Khalid is sending he is uh, instead of cutting the iol he's saying that uh, stephen lane has prescribed uh, a technique that you can put a spatula and folding the lens over the spatula and getting it out Yes, Actually, yes. I, I tried this technique, but it's damaging the coronal endothelium. I tried it once. I had the patient had the coronal edema and coronal, uh, coronal edema that lasts for about a month after because this folding the IOL inside the anterior mm. chamber definitely causes more damage to the endothelium. There are three techniques of IOL exchange. Mm. It depends on your uh, experience and your preference, whether to hold it from... Uh, uh, to, to fold it on the spatula or to hold it from one side and cut it into two halves or to hold it and cut it in just less than a quadrant and then rotate it through the wound and take it out. Yes, this most of the uh, surgeons doing this technique, but I don't like it because I feel that it damages more the wound itself and the endothelium here. So I prefer to do the technique that I can protect the whole endothelium as much as I can and to get the IOL out. Uh, just the, the, the yeah, one comment very nice uh, surgeries but one comment uh, actually two two points one when you were trying to do the counter pressure yeah the one of the tricks is to use a cogler hook instead of the spatula because then you can really hook the edge of the lens so you you stop it and uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, this is very, but there is also some instruments. It's like a scissor and a holder itself. So with the cochlear hooks, you can hold and move through and cut. And it's very useful yeah, and less yeah. uh, manipulations. Definitely, yes. But the problem of cochlear hook that I'm a little bit afraid to touch the iris or to touch the bag and here uh, you have bleeding or opening the perceived capsule. Definitely, as you say, there is a, something like a snapper that you can hold the IOL and cut it into two parts. Um, it's simply just to snap the um, IOL inside the, um, the edge of the of this. Um, it looks like a ring and to put the IOL in this ring and then hold it so it cuts into two halves. There are a lot of um, special scissors even for the IOL exchange, but again, it, it depends on your experience or your preference. Yes, and there is also a comment from Uger Onsel 
that uh, I was also I, I agree over it. In the last case of monofocal, there is now add-on IOL yes, multifocal. Yes. At but that time, there was no add-on IOL. And yes, I believe in Egypt also it is not available. I do agree. If I have an add-on IOL, I will put add-on zero multifocal. You, you can order it, uh, unless it will take long time, I think. Mm. Yes, I but there is, it's order. available now. It's available now. It's available now. Chairman, Holding uh, the intraocular lens inside the eye necessitates that it, it should be uh, a hydrophilic, not hydrophobic or uh, a three-piece. You shouldn't do this if it is a three-piece or hydrophobic uh, intraocular lens. You shouldn't yes. do it. You shouldn't do it. Uh, Hold Hold the eye. The eye. Folding. Folding. Okay. It's difficult to fold the hydrophobic actually, and uh, the hydrophilic is much easier. The is is uh, it will endanger the endothelium and uh, uh, angle structures. One of the tricks, if I may, and, uh, to uh, counter track the lens is to have the, uh, the haptic outside the wound and hold the McPherson outside the eye and then go with the scissors in a reverse motion. And actually, I, I only cut uh, uh, just one side of the lens to just pass the center mm -hmm. and deliver this one half and rotate the lens yeah, around it. its axis yes. uh, anti-clockwise and goes out. Uh, there are plenty of techniques. This is one of them. Thank you, Dr. Fatih. Thank you, Dr. Fatih. I believe, Dr. Fatih, you can present your case. You can share your screen. Sure. Maybe if we have time at the end, we will go because there was some questions to Dr. Yahya Salah, actually, and we haven't answered them. But after Dr. Fatih will finish and Dr. Shema. There is one question to Dr. Masri. Uh, the, uh, is it better to do specular microscopy to all cases before IOL exchange? Really, I'm doing specular microscopy for all my cataract patients hmm. uh, before the cataract surgery and especially before IOL exchange. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do yeah. agree to do specular microscopy for all we all, we all agree upon that. This is Dr. Thank Muhammad Farag. Thank you. Dr. Muhammad. Can you, see, can you see my screen, Dr. Ale? Yes, 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 of course. Is case number one. That's salvaging vision in an eye scheduled for evisceration. It was about an 85-year-old male presented seeking a second opinion for his left eye, which was actually scheduled for evisceration. This man actually uh, had undergone cataract extraction uh, with me 11 years ago in his other eye. And now this left eye which was known to have cataract for many years, recently developed symptoms and signs of endophthalmites, pain, loss of vision, hypopion, corneal opacification, and high intraocular pressure. There was no history of trauma or any recent surgical intervention that would explain the development of endophthalmites. This was this clinical picture with opaque cornea with She's the hypopion in, inside the anterior chamber. The patient showed no response with his primary consultant. And he is from Upper Egypt. He tried various kinds of uh, topical and systemic antibiotics with no response. So he was referred for a second opinion before proceeding with the scheduled evisceration. And when I examined him, the vision in the operated eye years ago was 0.5, and this affected eye was PL with poor projection. Intraocular pressure was 12 in the right eye, 65 in the left eye, with opaque cornea and hypopion. Uh, the first uh, unusual remark in this eye that the, his lids were not swollen, the conjunctival epistereal vessels were not injected which is not actually uh, usual with the case of endophthalmites. So starting, this could be something else. This was his hypopion with an irregular level. But on a closer look on his core, chamber and stick 
speaking to the back of the corner. So having opaque everything, so I, I, I requested a UBM as well as the B scan and electrophysiology. Mm -hmm. and, and on the B scan, the vitreous was full of exudative and the retina was flat. And the UBM actually gave the, 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 the clues for the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. that went through breaks in the anterior capsule, posterior perforations. His electrophysiology was rather disappointed with a very weak response on his ERG and VEP. So the possible diagnosis at this stage, rather than an endophthalmitis, was an extreme case of phacolytic glaucoma. That was highly suspected. We can still call it endophthalmitis, but rather than a, a, a microbial endophthalmitis, it's actually an endophthalmitis fecoanaphylactica. So the decision was taken to proceed with cataract extraction, with vitreoretinal support at the OR, and, and after obtaining a high-risk consent from the patient and the patient family. So we went ahead with the third the first point I wanted to Problem with the internet. Hmm. There is a problem with the internet with, in the, with Dr. Fatih. Yes. Uh, until Dr. Fatih will come back again, first of all, Dr. Shama, get ready. And uh, we have uh, one or two questions for Dr. Yahya. First of all, thanks for Dr. Hatem Ammar for following us. And he's giving a tip that he is cutting the IOL into three pieces in order to be able to finish his surgery through 2.2 millimeters. Of course, you have said so, Dr. Ahmed, that you can do it uh, anyway. Uh, I believe there is something... If the patient having bilateral corneal opacity and nystagma since birth, what is possible cause and what is the progress? Ah, this is for myself. Of course, uh, he has something in the macula, but actually we are treating him uh, from the corneal opacity. And actually his vision after doing the penetrating keratoplasty was about uh, 560 or 460. And actually he's, uh, and I am following him up till now and his uh, PKP is okay and he was very happy about the result. Uh, I am searching for the cases for Dr. Yahya. In uh, Dr. Adana Sultan, can it be this, hello, Ala. You are using bevel down, uh, yes. doing the holes, and aren't you afraid to uh, rupture the posterior capsule? Hmm. Dr. Uh, Dr. Yahya. Uh, you are using... You are using bevel down uh, FECO and uh, to make uh, this hole, isn't it uh, dangerous for the capsule? It's almost impossible to rupture the capsule doing this. Why? Bevel down, first you are going only the upper half. But even when you use bevel up, you can go as deep as you want because you see. And during hole drilling, remember, this is a very, very thick nucleus the total exposure even if it passes completely until the stopper 
it will not reach the end of the the nucleus. So actually, you don't risk at all in very hard nucleus to do this technique. And if you think it's a little bit not that thick or you debulk too much, just don't go inside full. Another question from Dr. Mohammed Barakat. He is asking you, is this technique is safe for beginners or independent surgeons or should it be for only for the experts? Generally, the hard cataract should be for more experienced surgeons, whatever the technique, yeah, and divide and conquer, whatever the technique, it needs more experience. But if you are reaching the level that you can do uh, hard cataract, I think this is technique is very reproducible. So it can be done with anybody. Okay. I believe, uh, Dr. Shama, if you are ready, uh, till Dr. Fathi will come back to us. Actually, I'm going to uh, present how to deal with the uh, cataract, the white cataract. And I'd like to thank Professor Fathi Fauzi because most of the tips I'm going to tell you now is from a, a lecture that he gave at the s words like nine years ago. I remember it, yeah, Ahmed Fan. It was a beautiful uh, lecture. Uh, I, I remember every tip that he said at that time. Actually, um, we have to stain these cases and we have to use a, a fine capsular axis uh, forceps. And we have to neutralize the pressure in the anterior chamber with the pressure inside the lens. So we have to put all the time uh, viscoelastic uh, material to um, neutralize the pressure, not to get escape of the uh, um, escape of the capsular axis. If you have uh, some of these uh, lens matter coming out, you can aspirate them for better visualization. But you can also use the viscoelastic to disperse this uh, material and to see your, your way during capsular access. Uh, Professor Fathi Fauzi told us many tips in such cases. The first thing is you have to evacuate the anterior chamber from the aqueous to get a very big bubble a one big bubble that you can put the tripan blue, uh, 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 one drop of tripan blue will be sufficient to stain the lens under the bubble. Some other people can use the viscoelastic to put the, uh, uh, the tripan blue, but you have to rub it against the capsule. If you do with the air bubble, you don't have to rub the tripan blue, but if you are using the viscoelastic, you have to rub it. Actually, if you have a good rexus, the white cataract is such an easy technique because it's like a choke. You can do uh, chopping easily. And uh, I prefer the white cataract like this one uh, without a, a very dense nucleus, it's, it's very easy to uh, chop uh, this kind of cataract. I love them. Uh, actually, you have to uh, remove all the lens matter. You will face some um, lens matter after you finish your cataract case. Sometimes you will face a problem, like in this case, there is a high pressure. We try to aspirate and then the, the fault here is I didn't do a small uh, rexus.
I should have done a spiral rexis better than this. Here, staining. You can put viscoelastic again and again. You shouldn't reach uh, the six or seven millimeter. You should be less than this. Because if you reach the seven millimeter, it will redirect you away in a, a centrifugal uh, manner, like what happened here. I should have stopped and put more viscoelastic. I didn't. So I faced. Um, extension of the uh, capsular axis at this area. I was trying to um, maintain my technique. As long as I have this area at, uh, at six o'clock without any rent in the capsular axis, I could try to finish my case without putting any power on the weak area here. So I tried gently to have a small bit by a small bit to do chopping. And I was afraid of extension of the weak area, but everything went fine. Here, you shouldn't go outside without putting viscoelastic because sometimes if you go suddenly, you may face uh, extension with bulge of the vitreous. When I was feeling that everything is safe, I have put my IOL in the bag because I, I can see still uh, there is remnants of the bag that I can put the IOL inside. You have to be very careful in your manipulations during IOL implantation because of the weak uh, area. I'm going to speak about something that I'm facing in many cases that I want the um, panelists to help me with. Sometimes you finish your case nicely and there is no problem at all in, um, in your case and you finish getting the epinucleus, then the cortex nicely. And now it's time to implant the IOL because everything is, is okay. But I noticed that there is something here. A small area of the nucleus that I could see. Sometimes we are seeing a very small part of the nucleus that it escapes sometimes behind the iris and you can't get it. And in the post-operative period, the patient will have iritis. And this is a question for the panel. What do you do to ensure that they get every single piece of the uh, nucleus at the conclusion of surgery? Well, I, uh, I always do what I call salka swoosh before the end of the surgery, is to go in with the irrigation 
from both sides of the paracentesis into the sulcus and let the, uh, the fluid circulate for about five seconds on each side. In many occasions, uh, I, I find small particles coming back into a view. Well, one important thing also is uh, to avoid this. This is, a, yeah, I agree with Dr. Fathi. At the end, you should always check there is no uh, particles. But one of the things to prevent this is to, whenever you crank, immediately you remove what you crank. Because sometimes you have a you crack and a small piece just flies away. So you continue and you will say, I will get it uh, later on. But sometimes it just flies under the, the eyes. So you have to look and at the end of the surgery, you have to look, but better to prevent it by avoiding. Really, really Dr. Yahya, we learned from Dr. Fathi the sulcus wash. Yes, this point of sulcus wash is very important at the end of the surgery. Just do some irrigation behind the iris or in the back. It will let any hidden particle come out. But but it's it's a good way. But you have also to be aware of it. It's not yes. just washing. Yes. Uh, yes. If you wash only, sometimes it, you can entrap it in the uh, sulcus. But you have to be aware during the uh, surgery and check. Also, sometimes there is bump in the iris, so you will see that the, you have to look for it. Yes. Prepare yourself for the next question that we, after I finish my presentation, what sh you should do if you find a small part in the post-operative uh, period. Now I'm going to shift to um, a technique that I am usually doing. If you have a, 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 um, a soft cataract like this and you couldn't get this, uh, you cannot crack it, it's very soft to crack, and you, you cannot do anything, and you are afraid to use the uh, uh, FECU. I found this technique useful, pushing uh, the, um, the epinucleus uh, with the uh, chopper to like a back somersault technique, pushing it to get it in the anterior chamber. I, I'm going to show it again. It's very... If you are afraid to go behind the anterior capsule and you are afraid to rupture the posterior capsule, you can use this technique. Push. And you can invert the the whole epinucleus. In some cases, we have uveitis and shallow, very shallow anterior chamber, especially in chronic congestive glaucoma. These patients may have some uveitis and they have this stuck pupil and very, very shallow anterior chamber. So the manipulations in the anterior chamber are very difficult. Usually, I, I like to remove this part that is making like a string to the um, the fibrotic part in the pupillary uh, margin. I usually prefer to remove it. There will be some bleeding, but this will allow the pupil to dilate nicely after uh, afterwards. After that, if you are doing a, a nice capsule of access, usually I don't do vitrectomy in such cases, but I do very good um, pressure on the eye before surgery, and I give many tool uh, 250 before surgery. Usually I don't need to uh, to do detract from me in such cases.
I want to show you how I do the three-piece uh, intraocular lens because many of my colleagues are finding I find finding it difficult to to do, and sometimes they will have uh, uh, the haptics maybe broken or uh, bent. So I want to show you how I do it. With this technique, you have to make sure that the leading haptic is inside the tube and the trailing haptic is like this, is above the uh, right. So if you push, you don't push the trailing haptic. And make sure that you have seen this occurring, the leading haptic is making like a finger like this and then you slowly push this leading haptic inside the bag so you are making sure that this haptic is inside the bag then you supinate a little bit your hand to allow the optic to go inside and then you produce again and then push the trailing haptic inside the bag so with this technique you don't make the trailing haptic coming outside the eye for fear of contamination and this is a very simple technique i want to show it to my colleagues because they sometimes find this uh, three-piece thing difficult. The last video that I'm going to show you is the posterior axis that I sometimes do. If I find the posterior capsule opaque, I can get rid of this opacity easily with polishing or so you can do the posterior axis. I know now that many of our colleagues are doing this posterior axis as a routine, but this was a fibrotic uh, posterior capsule. And the remaining of the video is as usual. We put it in this tire of um, inside the bag. I'm going to skip the other two videos because I know that Professor Fatih Fauzi is ready now. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shama. Actually, till Dr. Fatih will become ready, we have some comments and some questions from a very nice uh, audience. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Khalid is uh, saying that if there is a small piece, uh, in order to avoid small piece, uh, thus shake your hand immediately before leaving. Actually, I am doing such technique since years. Uh, thank you. Yes, I am shaking the, 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 the eye a little bit right and left uh, before leaving. This may, uh, it's uh, my, uh, like the idea of uh, irrigating under the iris of Dr. Fatih Kauzi. I want to Very tell you something, uh, Dr. Arya. Sometimes I, with this technique, you shake hands and then you, uh, you find a small piece that is sometimes comes behind the iris and then you try to get it and you see it and you are sure that there is a piece and then it's hidden you can't see it again and then you try everything to get it and you can't sometimes i'm like uh, trying hard for minutes and minutes and i can't get it okay and uh... There is also a debate about the use of Tripan Blue. Uh, this may be for Dr. Shama also. 
that Walid Tantawi is saying that uh, he is not aware of any scientific evidence supporting the assumption that trypan blue is uh, toxic to the corneal endothelium. And if you are using it for less than five minutes, it doesn't affect the cell morphology. And uh, that's why he personally stopped using air or anything. And he's putting the trypan blue and washing it directly without any uh, evidence of, uh, of harm to the endothelium. And actually, Ahmed Zawawi has uh, answered that this uh, experience is uh, there from uh, the corneal graft and uh, in the DMEC. And uh, if it remains for more than five minutes in contact with the endothelium and will have a negative effect, however minimal. What's your opinion or any of, uh, of the panelists having an opinion about I'm going to uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes but it is not full. Yes, it's okay. We okay. can go to the uh, go ahead and to, uh, uh, go from the start or uh, carry on where I stop from, from the video, uh, from the video, from the ultrasound and uh, the from the video. Yes, we have seen this. Okay, so we uh, Yeah, we have seen this. We have seen all this. So, yeah. Still, the diagnosis of uh, faecolytic severe case of faecolytic glaucoma. Yes, we have seen this. We have seen the investigations, the B scan, ultra UBM, and the electrophysiology, and the bad electrophysiology. Yes, we have seen this. Extreme case. Yes, still here. Yes. Can you see the video we now? Seeing. We can see it, yes. Can you see the video? Yes. yes. It's not playing. Uh, It's working, Dr. Fathi. Full screen your presentation, please. Dr. Fathi, put the full screen, please. Dr. Ale? Ayo, Dr. Fathi, put the full screen, please. Yes, yes, Dr. Fathi. Yes, yes, Dr. Fathi. Is it playing now? Playing, but in saccadic manner, actually. It's... Uh... Actually, it's the internet problem. It's not playing now. Is playing now? No, Dr. Fathi. What is uh, seen is uh, the electrophysiology. The video is on the net. The net is not enough. The net is not enough. Dr. Fathi, I'm going to try to shed the play bar. I'm going to try to make a fast forward so we can see all of the mistakes. يعني اكنك بتجر البار بتاع البلاي ده من تحت تشد يعني ايه؟ يعني اكن حضرتك يعني كانك بتسرع كانك بتسرع بس حضرتك اكنك عايز تعدي حته 
فتقدر حضرتك ت... ت... يعني هنقدر نشوف الستبس كلها لا بيهند يا يحيى لو عملت كده النت مش هيستحمل يا يحيى اوكي انا غيرت انا غيرت ال... الانترنت دلوقتي This is my last trial <تصفيق> اتفضل حضرتك لا هتبقى كويسه ان شاء الله شايفين حاجة؟ اه اه باين بس بي بالراحة كده. بي ماشي يعني فريم وقف فريم هو فريم واحد وواقف يا دكتور فتحي. الفيديو لا مش شغال الانترنت سرعة الانترنت مش كافية. احنا ممكن نشوف الفيديو التاني يمكن ممكن حاجة تعمل سكيب دكتور فتحي ممكن تدوس سكيب ايفن اف سلو ممكن نعمله بلاي من هنا يا فندم نعم ما كده شغال ما هو يعني اللي سلو يو ويل جاست جيت ايديا ايوه وين اي ونت انسايد ذا اي اند ذا فيرست بوينت تو بروف از تو سي ذات ذا كونيا واز اكشلي كلير سو يو سي ناو ام سينج تريسز اوف ذا ايرس سو باي ستارتينج ووشينج The, uh, this cheesy material now the cornea is proved to be clear. Now I'm clearing the this cheesy material that looked like a hypopion in the clinical examination. Can you see it? Yes. Yes, yes of course. And now I'm, I'm I'm trying staining. Now the capsule did not take the stain, and now I'm trying to open the capsule. With a with a needle, it did not open. I was penetrating the the capsule, but it cannot create an opening. So I had to use an MVR blade to have a reasonable opening into the capsule. That was a, a stone hard. And now we're restaining the capsule now. Obviously, it's impossible to do a regular rexes, so I'm now using a micro forceps and micro scissors to create a reasonable opening into the anterior capsule. Having got that opening, now I'm delivering this small endonucleus into the anterior chamber. Now trying to fake emulsify this small endonucleus, actually it was rock hard. And, and what is more difficult, actually it uh, had no posterior support. So how we would continue? Is it a question for the panelist, Dr. Fatheny, or? Uh... No, I will go ahead. Actually, I closed the wound. Hmm. And I shifted to 12 o'clock position. I did a 5.5 millimeter incision and delivered this hard nucleus that really had no posterior support. I knew from the UBM that the posterior capsule had micro and macro defects. So I couldn't trust using fake emulsification and losing the nucleus into the vitreous cavity. I did have some capsular remnants, but again, not reliable enough. So I thought I, I would clear everything. I know I have lens matter everywhere, including the vitreous cavity. So I thought doing a tear vitrectomy will clear lens things further. And now I used the, the, the uh, iris fixated lens. Um, and I prefer implanting them behind the iris. This is what should the lenses uh, should lie in the anatomical position. 
I'm buckling the iris to the lens. I can see the, the haptics and just push the iris tissue between the two clothes on either side. And then closing the globe. Now, uh, immediate post operative visit. Can you hear me? Yes, of course. We are we are following the that. The visual acuity improved to counting fingers. The cornea was reasonably clear. Intraocular pressure normalized and fundus could well be seen. With the pill disc, obviously. So we have a reasonably clear cornea and reasonable red reflex immediately post-operative. Then two weeks later, visual acuity improved further to 0.1. With a crystal clear cornea and nice red reflex. And the question now, why why the electrophysiology was poor, although the vision actually regained useful vision? And the answer was actually we did the electrophysiology under very high intraocular pressure of 65 millimeters mercury with no circulation in the retina or the optic nerve. It's like the minute when you're creating a flap during the, uh, the LASIK and uh, you tell the patient you will go blind in seconds because there is no circulation, no electricity at the, the back of the eye. So it was unfair to measure the electrophysiology when the, the pressure was above 60. And the, the second case actually was a lady, 65 year old with rapid loss of vision over the last few weeks. And this, in this time, it was diagnosed as bacterial, microbial, or as bilateral microbial corneal ulcers. Again, very resistant to various kinds of antimicrobials. And on examination, the vision was a PL with poor projection, both eyes. The intraocular pressure could not be measured because of the very irregular cornea. And tear chamber was lost in the right eye. And she had a perforated uh, cornea, or a, a perforated cornea, in the left eye, but with the negative C. Then. This was her right eye, and you can see now the the perforation here in the in the the cornea was a sign of iris tissue here. And this was her left eye that had a large corneal defect. What gave a clue to the diagnosis here was actually the lens matter inside the uh, chamber that looked like again like a hypopion ulcer. Again, the UBM gave away the diagnosis. You have now an empty bag with uh, plenty of uh, lens matter in the uh, anterior chamber. This is her left eye. We can see the, the lens matter actually were touching the cornea and actually perforated the cornea in the left eye. This was her uh, uh, scan, the flat retina. Again, the electrophysiology was again very disappointing because of the high intraocular pressure rather than optic nerve dysfunction. You can see on the report here, she had a severe conduction dysfunction. So the, again, the decision was a surgical intervention, at least in her better eye, the right eye. Again, with obtaining a high risk consent, with vitro retinal support at the OR, because we don't trust her posterior capsule. Again, gave preoperative many tool. And this time I decided to do an extra capsular technique. It's actually a very poor visualization for her cornea. I haven't actually shown extra capsular surgery in any presentation for years. Quite uh, 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 film are still helping us. Is it working with you? Can you see the video? Can you even ask full screen, Dr. Fahi? Dr. Ali. Hi, Dr. Fahi. Dr. Ali, can you hear me? Yes, of course. We can hear you. We can see the video? Yes. Yes, of course. We we cutting here. We are cutting. This the the envelope technique, the endocapsular technique. We're cutting the um, uh, an incision into the anterior capsule and obviously delivering 
what's left of the unemulsified or unliquefied lens and delivering the AP nucleus. ايوه كده لاغيني عليه عشان حاضر هو بيقف اصلا سرعه الانترنت الظاهر يعني بيقف بس فاهمين متابعين حضرتك وي كان فولو and obviously trying to watch what is left تمام watching what's left of the of the lens matter Now we can see the anterior capsule. Now we're implanting a PMMA lens into the capsular bag. The capsule and closing the eye. And postoperatively again, she again from poor projection of, uh, of perception of light into counting fingers and, and good useful vision. So phacolytic glaucoma is an inflammatory glaucoma caused by leakage of lens proteins through the capsule of immature or hypermature cataract proteins are released through microscopic or microscopic openings in the lens capsule. Proteins that precipitate secondary glaucoma, either the proteins in themselves or the engulfing macrophages would block the trabecular meshwork. They are rare, but the serious entity, they do happen Sometimes, or very often, they actually confused with microbial endophthalmitis or keratitis. Proper preparation and vitreating support at, uh, at the OR is crucial. UBM plays a main role in the diagnosis. And educating patients about complications of long-standing cataracts is important. Thank you, and very sorry for all this technical all right. Okay, questions. thanks very much. Thank, Thank you very so much. much. Thank you so much. In spite of these difficulties, but the presentation was really great. It's and clear. as usual, we learned from it. Thank you so much, Dr. Fatih. I have a question, Dr. Fatih, that I cannot understand. Uh, what is the relation of the corneal ulcer with uh, perforation with such case? Yani, we have seen cases of acuritic glaucoma. I presented the case, and I called it FACO in a hypopion uh, with hypopion. But actually, why there is corneal perforation? What's about the systemic condition? She has rheumatoid or something, or why? Why no, is it actually this is the, the toxic effect of lens matter? You know that every one of us, uh, we are not immunologically aware of the lens material, so they create actually an, a, a severe process of inflammation once they are re released from inside the lens bag. And uh, up to corneal perforation, I, I yeah, it is I, keratitis, mm. keratitis with continuous irritation. This is a, uh, the, a patient that actually very negligent and leaving everything until she was totally blind. Okay, so uh, that actually eroded the, the, the cornea until the cornea was perforated. Uh, the well, fact because she wasn't seeing with both eyes, so. Trauma is a possibility. Uh, Dr. Fatha, a very important message to all ophthalmologists, especially the young ones. Don't hesitate in removing any lens matter after cataract surgery. Because sometimes you find very small lens matter behind the cornea. And if you leave it, definitely it will lead to corneal decompensation and a big problem uh, for the MAC or the ZEC later on. And some uh, surgeons are a little bit reluctant in removing this lens matter. So the... Um, the message from our experience, all this is, please, please, any lens matter in the anterior chamber should be removed immediately. You should wash it. Definitely, the patient doesn't complain of anything. His vision is perfect, and you can ignore it. But please don't ignore it, because we saw cases of coronary decompensation and lost eyes due to uh, reluctance in removal of this lens matter. Well, here, yeah, Dr. Ahmed Shama touched this point. Well, yani, what do you do if you see a uh, nuclear fragment in there at six o'clock in the anterior chamber. The patient is not complaining. It's a six-six vision. It I'm should. sure these parts do not get absorbed. They are immunologically indigestible, and uh, they should be removed. And he showed the technique of removing. Dr. Fathi, I have a case actually uh, here in my uh, in my desk that one of my friends I have done fecal for him, 
and he was six six and everything was quiet and he's my friend and i seeing him regularly and then after one and a half year yes. i found a piece yes. at the six o'clock and i entered i removed it because at that time it started to induce iritis for him i wonder one and a half year without causing three years the trial i saw a case after three years of fake not my case but it was very nice case straightforward Hmm? Patient didn't complain. She was regular follow up with her doctor. Nothing. And after three years, less matter appeared in the AC. Yes, Definitely. One, one and a half years. It's, it's very strange, actually. Yes, a long time. We have, they, they do we not have, get absorbed. The nuclear fragments or epinucleus, they do not get absorbed. They might get actually uh, equified, but they still, the material the proteins are there causing an inflammatory reaction. Yeah. Inflammatory, yes. We have. Uh, we have some questions. Actually, Dr. Sharif Ikrami from uh, from UK. Uh, hello to all panelists. Uh, does anyone uh, use helon five in white intumescent cataract? Maybe this for Dr. Shama as a choice for uh, gaining high counter pressure. Yani in white cataract, is it better to use high viscosity uh, viscoelastic, or it doesn't matter? Also for for all panelists. Actually, it is uh, recommended to use helium-5. Actually, I, I don't uh, use helium-5. I use a very small uh, incision, and I use a very small rexus, uh, like the goiter, because if you have a, a, a rexus like the goiter, you can manipulate without getting out the viscoelastic material. But uh, it's not common to use helium five in Egypt. We don't have. At one time we had helium GV, but I don't think we have the helium five. No, we don't have. Mm. It. Right. There is another question. I believe we have to answer it from uh, Momin Arifi from Bahrain. Uh, does any of the respective faculty have an experience with single piece hydrophobic acrylic lens placed in the sulcus after small tear in the Hoshirka school? Yani single piece IOL, can you put it in the sulcus or not? This is the question. Only certain platforms like the uh, hydrophobic, like the Technis or the um, Acrisoft, those are the only that I use to put them in the sulcus with small rents because the platform is, um, is, is large and it's well formed that can withstand staying in the mm. circuit without disintegration, like in hydrophilic, definitely it will decenter. So never ever to put the hydrophilic in the circuit because it will uh, definitely decenter. Any other opinion, Agama? You are muted. Dr. Yahya, you are muted, Dr. Yahya. Open, Yani, you are muted. Dr. Fahi, any overall? The overall diameter is the important thing. Yeah, it's yes. 30 mm. millimeters. So if you have to leave uh, one piece, it, it should be 13 millimeter diameter. And these are the two platforms, Dr. Uh, Ahmed Al Ali. Okay. Now some people are saying it's not preferred to put even in the 13 millimeter because of iris shaping, but I'm not very convinced of this. Time. Uh, there are many reports, Dr. Ali, in, um, in the in single piece uh, hydrophobic lenses can cause uh, UGH uh, syndrome. Uh, the, polish, the polish of the uh, single piece is not like the polish of that uh, uh, of the three pieces, and um, it is intended to be inside the bag, not to be in the sulcus, not to touch the uh, uveal tissue. For myself, in my own opinion, I never use single piece in the sulcus, even Akisov or Technis. If there is any doubt, I will use a three piece because the idea Yahya told about the overall diameter, it should be large. Otherwise, we will have a sunset or uh, appearance for this IOL. IOL is stay centered. Uh, I wouldn't implant a single piece in the sulcus if I, if I had the option. Yes, it's the rule. Yes, let's obey the rule. Actually, thank you very much. Now it's 11 o'clock in Egypt, and I believe we have uh, spent two nice hours together.
thank you very much for all panelists and thank you for the audience and thank you for your comments from all over the world actually uh, and uh, maybe we are preparing for the next webinar and uh, follow us in the iHub episode 4 that will be next Sunday at 9 o'clock inshallah thank you thank you thank you thank you very much bye bye شكرا جزيلا ميرسي وحشنا وعايزين مؤتمرات بقى بحق وحقيقه ان شاء الله ان شاء الله